Well, friends, our lesson today is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Well, I don't know. Sometimes uh, I, I like movies and books. I tend to be a nonfiction reader, and I like movies uh, that are based on true, true stories. Okay, so I've always been a fan of those. And you know how sometimes you have a movie that focuses on a pivotal, just a pivotal period, a pivotal incident in a person's life, you know, so it, it might be uh, a, te- a sports team having their championship season, or it might be uh, the start of an unlikely romance, or it might be a court case that, that a lawyer wins. And usually when you have those movies where there's uh, the one incident, one little part of a person's life that's been the focus, then at the closing credits, they do things like tell you what happened in the rest of their life, you know, so they sit there and say, oh, they went on you know, to win four more championships, or the lawyer went on, or that couple went on, or whatever, and they tell you what happened. And I always love watching that part, because I like learning what happened after that incident. And and frankly, that was always something that I kind of thought about the Zacchaeus story, because he comes out of nowhere, all right? He comes out of nowhere with this story, and then he has this tremendous transformation that you see, and you never hear about him again. And a part of me used to wonder, you know, what was going on with him, and what happened afterwards? You know, why did this happen? I mean, the only backstory they give you is that he's a chief tax collector, and he's rich, which, by the way, kind of goes hand in hand. There was no such thing as a poor chief tax collector, because, you know, I've mentioned it every time. You've got to remember it. They're hated. Tax collectors are hated because they abuse the people. They over-collect on the taxes, and they had the authority to do that, and they could keep whatever they over-collected, and that was how they acquired their wealth. And so there was really no break on their authority. And so he's a chief tax collector, and he's rich, and so he's hated, you know, they're hated, and even Jesus talking to him is not received well by the people because they don't like him talking to him. And we don't know what's going through his mind. There's no backstory. There's nothing that says what's going on in him that makes him so anxious to see Jesus. All we see is that he's, he's a tax collector, and then it says he wants to see who Jesus is, and he can't because he is short. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. Where's that yearning coming from? We don't know, and we'll never know. But there's one thing I want to talk about here for a second that that might be interesting in thinking about the story. Uh, In the history, in 2,000 years of Christianity, our history of interpreting Scripture has changed in many, many ways, okay? Uh, What you hear about in the modern age, sort of the post-Renaissance age, is this idea of, of reading the stories as if they are histories, Okay, so you kind of hear these stories as if they're histories and it just kind of happened this way, and you just sort of take those facts as being facts. Okay, in the early church, that wasn't the way they ever looked at scripture. In the early church, the way they looked at scripture was that everything was allegorical, everything was metaphorical, everything that was there had a symbolic meaning. Okay, so it wasn't just a matter of a fact 
they would sit there and, and analyze this and, and look at a, at a passage like this and say, hmm, climbed a sycamore tree. Why sycamore? See, the modern person just says, because it was there. If it was an apple tree, he would have climbed an apple tree. If it was an orange tree, he would have climbed an orange tree. If it was a, an evergreen, he would have climbed, you know, whatever. It's just, it just happened to be the closest tree. But in the early church, they would have actually read the story, and they would have said, no, wait a second. But then, why did they mention sycamore? Why did they use the word? Why would they bother telling you the kind of tree it is unless there's a meaning to the kind of tree? Okay, So they would have analyzed this symbolically. And when you look at this story, just this one paragraph with that kind of symbolic sense, you can start to see a couple things that maybe you hadn't thought about. What did it mean, metaphorically, allegorically, symbolically, that he was short? What did it mean? Was there, was there a symbolism to that? Was there a symbolism in him needing to climb something in order to see? And they would have looked at the story and started to ask questions like this. What helps you see Jesus? What blocks your view? What are the things that make it hard for you to see Jesus in your life? What are the things that help lift you up to get a better view of who Jesus is? See, one of the things you could look at is they just said, he's a tax collector and he's rich. He has power and he has money. Are those things that made him symbolically short in stature? Are those things that made it hard for him to actually see who Jesus is. And maybe he needed some help. He needed some assistance. He needed a way to be able to get a view. He wanted to see Jesus, but it was hard for him to see Jesus because of these things in his life that made it difficult. See, sometimes we have those things. We have cultural Upbringings. We have our, our status. We have our position. We have different things in life that actually make it hard for us to see what Jesus wants us to see of him. The tree gives him a way to see Jesus, and then Jesus, of course, responds to that desire and comes to him and says, Zacchaeus, and by the way, you'll notice that Jesus knows his name. Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. This little reminder in the story, this little thing that says, you know what? God's going to come for you. God's going to you know, He didn't say, hey, why don't you come over? I'm having dinner at Peter's house today. Why don't you come on over there? No, he's like, no, I'm coming to your house. You, you've indicated this interest in me. You want to see me. You want to know me. I am going to come to your house. Jesus invites himself over because God is willing to take those steps. God is willing to pursue and, ma and, and come to you to make it easier for you to encounter him. And then we get to the, to the crux of the story here. When Jesus gets to Zacchaeus' house, He's overjoyed. He's overjoyed. I mean, imagine you were acting the story out. Suppose someone wrote this story out and said, hi, we're going to have a little drama workshop today. And, and in this drama workshop, you know, you get to play Zacchaeus. Here's his line. Here's, here's his line. Here's what he says. Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. How do you play that role? You don't just read it straight up, right? You know, I mean, this is one of those huge, big, joyous declarations. I also always kind of imagined him slightly having had a little too much wine, maybe, at this dinner. I'm not sure, but he, you know, but it's kind of got that feel. Look, it's grand. 
I, I see him standing up and making a grand declaration to everyone who's assembled. Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, and by the way, that is almost certain because that's where his wealth came from, okay? His whole living, the whole living of a tax collector is based on overcharging people. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And this does not sound at all calculated. See, the key is that this does not sound like he sat at the dinner table with a pencil and a piece of parchment going, let me see, if I give away half, I think I probably defrauded people out of this much and multiply by, you know. He wasn't calculating what this would do to his IRA. He wasn't calculating how much he would have left after he did this. He simply makes a declaration based on what he believes is right, based on the fact that he is overjoyed to be in the presence of Christ. He is overjoyed to have Jesus want to stay at his house, and he is just going to respond with this joy. And I wonder, have we done that in our lives? Have we ever responded to God coming into our life to to a point in the time when we really thought about or or just felt that relationship that we were developing with Jesus and responded in this way that was just unbridled, overwhelming joy? Where we didn't think about it, we just were going to respond. Have you ever done that? I think sometimes you have, maybe. Maybe. Sometimes you've seen that story in the news about somebody who's hurting something that's happened and it it just touches you and and you just write that check or pull out that credit card and, and you send more than what you would have because it just moved you. You've done that, I hope. But have you ever responded to God that way? I mean, this could bankrupt him. You look at this and you do the simple math and you think this man is going to be broke. But it doesn't matter. See, it doesn't matter. See, if your principles are constrained by pragmatism, they're not principles anymore. If you're going to live the principled life, you live the principled life and and you don't ask, what does this mean? What will happen? I'm going to live by my principles. You know, there was a story this week that kind of incensed me. Um, Not a huge story. You know, it was one of the things that comes across my news feed and Facebook. And and it was the the story uh, that happened at the Eastman School of Music. It's one of the top music conservatories, you know, in the United States. And if you know anything about the classical music world today in terms of classical music study, um, most of the schools are dominated by Asian students. Uh, Okay, I mean, if you go to Manhattan School of Music, go to Juilliard, it's a lot of Asians. Okay, and, and lo- not just uh, immigrants, but quite a number of Asians who are here from places like Korea and China and studying. And China has been upset with South Korea over some diplomatic thing, and so the Eastman School of Music was sending an ensemble to China to tour, and the Chinese government refused to give visas to the South Koreans in their orchestra. The, the school's first response was to say they'll go anyway and leave the Korean students behind. And when alumni, when the, the larger community heard about this decision, there was this huge outcry saying, are you kidding? How can you do that? How can you say, okay, we'll just go anyway, we'll just leave the Korean students behind and, and go, you know, and just go. And so under this outcry, You know, sometimes the apology is worse than the original offense. So under this outcry, 
the, 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 the school decides, okay, we're going to postpone our tour indefinitely. Okay, we're not going to go unless every student gets a visa. And then the dean in this interview says this. He's, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, it was important to tour because to not go on this tour uh, can hurt our ability to, like, recruit students from China. And he called it an ethical dilemma. And I'm like, no, that's not an ethical dilemma. That's just ethics. You see, an ethical dilemma is when you have two choices and both of the choices have an element of being unethical. You know, I'm in a place where I have to hurt this person or I have to hurt this person. Neither of those is ethical. That's an ethical dilemma. This was just the cost of being ethical. <laughs> it was like, yes, if we are ethical, we may lose some students. Okay. It's not an ethical dilemma. That's simply saying I'm going to be ethical. And we face that in our lives. Sometimes we just say, you know, we're going to do the right thing. <laughs> and, and if you're constraining that by pragmatism, it's not principled anymore. You don't teach your kids to do the right thing unless the cost is high, then, then forget it. <laughs> you know where that starts to lead. Teach them to do the right thing. And, but when you do that, when you say, I'm going to do the right thing and I'm not going to worry about the consequences, what happens is that it seems reckless. Principled living will seem reckless to people who don't share that point of view. Principled living will seem reckless because you are literally saying, I am going to live according to my principles no matter what it brings. This is not to say that living, principally, living in a principled manner is always going to be costly. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you are lucky. Sometimes in a given circumstance, being principled will work to your benefit. Sometimes people will look at you and they will say, wow, that's, that's awesome. You're a principled person. I want to do business with you. I want to have you in my life, etc. Okay, so sometimes being principled helps. I'm not saying it's always costly. Sometimes it is costly. Sometimes you're principled and it costs you something. Sometimes you're principled and it could cost you everything. The point is, you decide that you're just going to be principled. And so we go back to my original question. I wonder what happened to Zacchaeus. And what I realized was it doesn't matter. It's a good reason not to tell you what happened. Because if, if they had told us what happened to him, then they're saying that what happened to him is a factor in what he should have done. Instead, we don't know. Maybe in his act of generosity and giving all this money back, he, he dies surrounded by the love of the people in the town who used to hate him and now they love him because he has turned a new leaf. Maybe. Maybe he goes bankrupt and dies hated and penniless on the edge of town because people don't forgive him for what he had done to them and he, despite the fact that he paid the money back and maybe that's what happens. We don't know and we'll never know. But what I learned is not to worry about it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because he chose to change his life, to live according to the principles of Christ. And in doing that, he wins. See, in that song we sang, I love that song, Reckless Love. It's one of the best new songs in the Christian scene. And, and, and there's that little line in there. There are all these scriptural allusions that come up in the song, but there, there's that little line that I love. The, the line that I think I love the most is the line where it says, and he leaves the 99. Okay? And, and you remember that story that Jesus tells, right? About, about if you have a hundred sheep and you, and you lose one, he leaves the 99 to go after the one. 
And people analyzing that story have always said, why would you do that? Yes, you, you want to keep all 100 together, but you, you're going to leave the 99 alone while you go after the 1? What if? What if a wolf comes after the 99 while you're gone? What if another two, uh, you know, got lost? So what if you leave the 99, you go after the 1, you find the 1, you come back and you count, and wait, 97? Oh, great. What would Jesus do? Go after the, t- <laughs> the two new ones that are gone. All right? He would keep doing it. He would keep going. And he'd go, come back and go, 92, come on. <laughs> you know? He would keep coming back and keep going out and keep coming back and keep searching for the ones who are newly lost because the principle was you go after the ones who are lost. And you don't just write them off. He wasn't going to do the calculation that says, the odds are if I go after the one, I'm going to come back and there's only going to be 97 left. He doesn't do that calculation. He just says the right thing to do is to get after the one who's lost. So he does it. Can we live that way? Can we live that way? Can we start to just say, hey, you know what? Let's stop calculating. Or calculate less. Baby steps. Can can we just try to do what's right a little more often and calculate the consequences of that a little less often? Can we do it out of a, a joy of being in a relationship with God? A joy that should move us to a certain recklessness a recklessness of obedience to what Christ calls us to do. And understand that if we do that, that's winning. No matter what happens. Because that's what matters. Amen.